What's going on? What's going on, everyone who's watching this podcast right now? Welcome to the Nikhil Sai Show, which is hosted by me, the Nikhil Sai. And guess what's going on today? We are back with another amazing two Kama Club interviews. So just make sure to stick around. This is going to be amazing in case if you're a business owner, everything you should be focusing on in the first place is sales, right? And we are having a sales ninja today. So just make sure to stick around. This guy is crazy when it comes to entrepreneurship sales. He's been into this industry. I mean, the entrepreneurship journey from over 25 years. He started his journey as an entrepreneur at the age of 12. This is a crazy story to hear, guys. So make sure to pick a pen and paper and start noting every single thing, the golden nuggets, which he's going to drop today. He has been multiple coaching companies in three different states and scaled them to over eight figures, which is freaking amazing. So let's not waste any time and actually welcome Zach Harlow, founder at The Benefit Doctor. Hey, Zach. Oh, you're on mute. Probably be help if I wasn't muted. But Nigel, thanks for having me on the show, man. I greatly appreciate it. It's an honor to hang out with you and your tribe today. Absolutely, Zach. We are we're pretty excited to have you, brother. So, Zach, this is a crazy story. Like starting entrepreneurship at 12 years old, like that's that's crazy. So we'd love to hear, like, can you tell us your backstory? Like, how did all of this crazy journey start? Yeah, absolutely. So as you as you know, I started when I was about 12, uh, 11, 12 years old, somewhere right in there. In the true world of entrepreneurship, it really started even before then, but I'll skip that part of the story and kind of fast forward to where I got a little bit more serious around the age of 12. Uh, my dad gave me a lawnmower and a weed eater, and I started walking up and down the block and got clients and neighbors and, and friends and family to hire so I could cut their grass. And by the time I was 15 years old, I bought a pickup truck and my learner's permit license, and I would drive around town with my mom. She'd sit in the car or sit in the truck and read a book because I wasn't allowed to drive alone. And by the time I was 16 and in high school, I had my obviously at that point, my driver's license and a thriving little business. And that little business ended up putting me through college and I paid cash for college going through and just simply building up this little landscape or, or lawn care company. And um, that is what truly ignited the fire that has turned into this entrepreneurial journey for now 25, 26 years. Wow, brother. That's really exciting. Starting a loan business as a 12 year old, like that's crazy. The best sure. part is you didn't take a student loan like 95 other people, right? Like just do it. And you paid in cash for the college. So it's like making your own money while you're young. Wow. That's that's an amazing, that's an amazing place to be for a lot of people. Zach, that's really awesome. And you're the sales ninja here. So a lot yeah. of business owner to admit. They're not sales ninjas, right? Sure. Actually. So we would love to hear like how to actually become a sales ninja. So what is sales ninja? How can someone become that? Well, listen, uh, uh, first of all, you got to have a really good haircut and a nice kept beard. And <laughs> I joke a little bit, but man, I, I'll tell you what, um, becoming truly great at sales has allowed me to have a life uh, that, that honestly, I feel a little bit, sometimes I got to pinch myself and see if I'm living a dream. Nikhil, we've spent the last 18 months uh, with my four-year-old twins and my wife. We've been kind of touring the country in our RV. Uh, we've been full-time on the road now. And one of the things I set off 18 months ago, and I said, I'm not getting a haircut and I'm not shaving until we get home. I thought that was going to be four or five months. I had no idea we would love that lifestyle so much that we've extended and extended. And by the time we finally get back home... And, and settle back down, it will be an 18 month trip. So uh, that's all to say this, if you get really good at sales, it'll open up doors for your business and opportunity to impact others' lives in a way that um, a lot of people don't ever get to realize. And, and here's the bottom line point of becoming great at sales. Truly becoming great at sales is, is means that you're really good at meeting people's needs where they're at. True sales is all about service. It's all about how you serve your clients, how you show up for your clients, the end result that you help a client get, whether you're a filling, selling a physical product or a, a coaching program or a mastermind program, whatever it is. Like at the end of the day, sales is about the way you serve your clients. Uh, that's amazing. So once people realize that sales is actually serving clients, it's, it's like a 360 degrees turnover for them, right? That's really amazing, Zach. So let's get to the next question here. This is going to be pretty amazing. So as a sales ninja, you've been helping a lot of businesses to get into high ticket sales, teach them strategies on how to close at higher tickets because most of the entrepreneurs, they even fear to kind of ask that sort of money. 
right? Let's yeah. say if they're charging five figures, six figures for their products and services or coaching programs, whatever. They'd be like, oh, like, can I really do that, right? That that kind of skepticism is still existing in most of the business owners. So we'd love to hear your take on like this high ticket sales strategy, like how someone can actually create a high ticket offer and sell it confidently. Your Your price tag is only relevant to the result that you help drive. Like if you know that you make a big impact in whatever it is that you're selling, right? If, if I am selling a product or a coaching service or a physical product or whatever it is, if I'm selling a thing and I know that that thing can get somebody a defined result that increases their productivity or profitability or whatever it is, uh, by a certain fold, then it's very easy for me to price that service at some people consider it high ticket. Some people don't. It really, it, it doesn't, I don't know that price necessarily all much matters, uh, matters all that much as opposed to what result do you get? So if you're, if you're pricing a product at $2,000 a month, let's say, well, if you're helping them drive $20,000 a month in profit, a 10 X on their return, nobody's going to complain about writing you that check or cashing that credit card for two grand every month. Right. But if you charge two grand a month because some coach told you to sell high ticket, but you're not at all proven in the marketplace where you can get your $2,000 investment to equal, maybe they'll make 20 to 2000, 2,500, 3000. Well, then you're crazy. You're, you're going to have a churn rate. That's just going to burn through until, uh, you lose more clients than you can gain and ultimately you'll be out of business. So price is only affixed really to the defined end result you know you can get someone. So we have programs that we charge a couple thousand dollars a month to have a client on our program, but I know we have proof. Lots and lots and lots and lots of people standing in line saying, dude, pay Zach 2000 or 2500 or $3,000 a month because if you do, this is going to be the end result because he did it for me and he did it for me and he did it for me. Like uh, the social proof at that point just kind of takes over. Yeah, absolutely, Zach. I think that's really interesting. Like people really need to understand that it's not the price they're charging for the service or the product. It's the outcome they're going to get. Right? And I believe, as you just mentioned, they should be really thinking about, okay, what is the outcome? Charge one by 10th of it. Boom. You got the sale. Easy, easy conversation, right? Easy. That's, that's yeah, that's amazing. Zach. Okay, let, let me expand on that real quick. I think this is such an important topic because in the world of, of especially the digital entrepreneur, I hear this talked about all the time. And these gurus saying that you need to raise your price and you need to be charging. If you're charging, charging $200 a month, you're an idiot. You should be charging 2000. And if you're charging 2000, what's wrong with you? You should be charging 10,000. And, and uh, I, you know what, if you're just in it for the money, if you're just in it to see how much strike you can run through your account, then, you know, knock yourself out. I'm, I'm definitely the wrong person to talk to though, because I believe in building a business that survives long beyond one or two home runs. Like you're, you're playing a long game here. And if you're going to build a business that is still around in two years and three years and four years, then you have to get, like you absolutely must provide substantial more value to your clients than what you charge in price. Like any, any ding dong can learn a couple of scripts and learn uh, some, some closing techniques and become so good at sales. You, you can tell how much I hate this stuff. And, and, and secure a couple of clients paying high ticket but if you don't get, if they don't get substantially more value, like that 10X we just talked about, then they're just going to leave you. They're just going to leave you. And you do that to two people, three people, four people, 10 people, 20 people. Some people, I guess, some business owners, some entrepreneurs, maybe they're wired to take people's money. Maybe they get it once or twice or three times and then the client leaves them and they don't care. They're just like, well, on to the next client. That's not me. Like I, I like getting 10 clients and I like 20 clients and I like 30 clients and I like 40 clients. And then I like to get rid of the accidental bad clients that I accidentally allowed in. And so now I'm back to 35 clients and then I'm going to, does that make sense? Yeah, like if you're going to grow easy. and grow and grow, you have got to get laser focused. Your audience, your, your, the people, uh, these digital entrepreneurs or, or virtual entrepreneurs or brick and mortar entrepreneurs, it boils down to something so simple. 
Provide more in value than what you charge in price and people will keep coming back to you. Provide more in value than what you charge in price and people will keep coming back to you. Provide more in value than what you charge in price and your business will grow. <laughs> Absolutely, Zach. I love it. Yeah, you really nailed it with the answer. I believe you already kind of cleared all the market standards on how high ticket sales should be viewed and your perspective is an entirely different ball game. So I believe a lot of entrepreneurs should adapt it to what you just mentioned, which is understanding sales is actually helping others, not just taking that check and running away, right? That's that's really amazing, Zach. Love the point. And absolutely, let's get to the next question, brother. And we see while you are on this podcast, even you are like your body language is creating so much trust, like you're naturally moving in a way that it creates so much trust. And in sales, I believe body language plays a key role. So we would love to hear your take on like the body language importance when it comes to the actual sales process and how to manage it well. The more, the more authentic and natural you can be, the better you're going to do. You know, I've got the, the luxury of having decades of experience. And I have met with, at this point, thousands of business owners over the last 20-something years. Um, having a sales conversation and body language for me is just now absolutely second nature. But here's... Here's, uh, I will tell you, Nikhil, I went through courses many, 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 many years ago, a long time ago, and learned about body language and posturing and how you should do this or not do this or lean in or not lean in, like all the, a, a, a gazillion different ways to posture yourself for the sales conversation. And that's, that's fine. Like, I'm not saying may, maybe I learned something from it. Maybe I didn't. But here's what I have learned about how to be ultra successful in sales is find a way to be yourself find a way to be incredibly authentic. I mean, it's the reason I can show up on today's podcast. I probably needed to go get a haircut and put on one of my collared shirts and put on a sports jacket. And I probably needed to dress up and look pretty today, right? Like probably. Uh, the truth is that 15 minutes ago, we were just outside that door that you can't see right there. And my kids are out there and they're swimming in a giant swimming pool that being good at sales paid for. <laughs> so instead I ran in the house, threw a ball cap on, threw a t-shirt on and jumped in front of the camera. Not, not that this is not a very important meeting and an important place to be, but my real true authentic self, like, like the reason you're having me on the podcast is not because I can wear a nice blazer and I can put on a nice shirt or I can shave a beard. You had me on today's podcast because I can, I, I I'm really good at the one thing I'm really good at. Right. Absolutely. And that, the faster people can adapt and understand that if you if you try to over posture or overcompensate by not to, not to say that dressing to impress isn't isn't a thing, but I'll tell you the clients that work with me today they do not work with me. Like you want to know how I show up on every Zoom call with clients who pay me thousands of dollars a month? <laughs> You're looking at it, right? Like uh, some of these people want to. They look and say, man, what would it be like if I could travel? If, if they get to the point in their business where they can take off for a year or take off 18 months and travel the country with their family and hang out in an RV or go travel the globe or whatever matters to them doesn't come as a result of learning how to posture yourself in a conversation. It comes across as, do you know what you're talking about? And if you don't yet know, like if you don't, it goes back to that pricing conversation we just had. If you don't know yet, then if you think you know you're able to help them, then then give your service away or do it very inexpensively or run a beta or whatever it is that you need to do to get proven, defined, holy freaking crap. I thought we were going to do this, but what we ended up doing was like 5X over that. This thing is awesome. And then when you've done that for two or three or four or five people, man, your body language and your posture is going to take care of itself because you've got this thing in your backbone called confidence. Mm, absolutely, Zach. I love it. I, I honestly did. Like, I think that's one of the main reasons why people kind of dramatically try to do body language, trying to position themselves as an expert. But for a fact, they know that their product is crappy. So they try to show up like they're confident on the screen and they fail to do it. And that's why a lot of people get out of the sales calls easy. But as you mentioned, if they know that their product is perfect and if they have already got the results, their spine is standing straight. 
and they, they, their Amen. eyes are very sharp, right? Like they are just like they're just like sharp as a tack, and that helps them to close. And the body language comes with it. That's really awesome. So not trying to mimic body language, try giving reserves. So that's how your body language fixes itself. Simple as that, right? That's that's I, amazing. I truly that. believe it fixes itself by you gaining confidence. Now, if you need like some of the absolute basic, basic, basics, well, then it's the same thing your mama taught you, right? Sit up straight, shoulders <laughs> back, chest out, and smile. There you go. There's body language. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing stuff. So yeah, guys, that, that's pretty interesting. So make sure to note down, sit up straight, chest up, smile every time, okay? There you go. That's amazing, Zach. Yeah, love it, love it. This is the eight figures sales strategies which Zach Harlow is dropping on. So make sure to stick around. So Zach, I've seen you scaling multiple businesses through the roof using different sales strategies and obviously amazing leverage with the teamwork. So we'd love to hear how was the journey scaling multiple companies to over eight figures with the strategies? Whoo, man, holy cow. Um phrase your question one more time make sure i'm following here how you have how was the journey actually when you're trying to scale your companies to over eight figures so we'd love to learn the journey on how you have scaled it so quickly oh exhausting and i wouldn't call it quick this has been 20 something years in the making right like oh my God. Uh, i'm not i'm not uh, mark zuckerberg i'm not a tech founder i didn't raise millions and millions of dollars through an ipo or through a series a funding i'm just a redneck west cut texas country boy uh um i know how to work hard and i've got a work ethic that that uh, uh outpaces many and because of that and just staying true to form I, I can't remember what book is it that talks about um the rule of ten thousand hours do you know which one i don't know what i can't remember the book off the top of my head but the idea is basically very simple you never become an expert in the thing that you're supposed to be an expert at until you put 10,000 hours in practicing that thing, right? And so 10,000 hours for many of us is years and years and years worth of chasing the same dream, pursuing the same opportunity, and then refining our process, right? I used to tell myself, oh, I still tell my sales teams that I manage and work with all the time, I'm like, look, just because you have 20 years of sales experience doesn't mean jack squat because the truth is, most people don't have 20 years of sales experience. They have two years of sales experience repeated 10 times. Now let that sink in for just a minute. Like unless you are actively pursuing growth, unless you are actively pursuing this thing right here, like you don't grow from, from a $20,000 a year business to a $200,000 a year business to a $2 million a year business by selling more crap. That's not, that's not what got you from 20,000 to 2 million because the person you were to grow a $20,000 business is not the same person you will have to be to manage a $2 million business. You have to take the entrepreneurial journey where this thing right here gets fed all the time, right? And so if you talk to the average person, the average person spends hours, I don't even know what it is anymore, but it's hours and hours and hours in front of what? Phone. Television. Or their phone, right? Scrolling yeah. Facebook, looking on Instagram, screwing around on TikTok, um, uh, watching Netflix, binge watching the newest, latest, greatest series. And if that's what you want to do, fine. But when, when's the last time you sat down and, and consumed? When's the last time you were on an audible and, and you just listened to a book or you meditated over, over a reading or, or dug in through your Bible or whatever it is that feeds your soul and feeds your mind? Are you, are you making sure it's getting the proper nutrients? Because without this thing getting fed, there's no way you grow to seven and eight figures. Wow, absolutely, Zach. You nailed it with the answer. And I believe this is a lot of business owners. This, they need to pay attention to this. They are being that hamster wheel trying to make things up when they're not mentally prepared or doesn't have that exact nutrition they need to feed themselves to the next level, right? They're mentally sure, not man. prepared to scale, right? That's amazing. So first of all, they need to win in this so that they can really win in the game they are playing. That's amazing, Zach. And Zach, let's get to the next question. The different type of business when it comes to the side, I've, I was amazed by looking at this. Also. So we'd love to hear the strategy and the actual business plan on how actually the benefit doctor works. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
Man, for uh, for the better part of 16 years, I spent time traveling all over three different states, multiple operations, uh, building insurance agencies for one of the largest insurance carriers in the United States. And we wow. would take little bitty, teeny tiny sales teams or non-existent sales teams. And within a few years, we'd grow them to 2 million, 5 million, 5.5 million. Um, so to grow from scratch to 5 million plus in just a couple of years, we had some pretty pretty darn good growth. And we did that in in three different states. Well, that was a lot of fun. And I got paid very, 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 very well for doing that work. Mm-hmm. But uh, somewhere around 2019, uh, we started looking at what was happening in the marketplace, what had happened as a result of the Obamacare legislation and healthcare reform, uh, where businesses and business owners with employees were struggling. And we had in our toolbox only one set of tools to try to help these businesses. And I, in 2019, I'm like, look, I've been on this journey for now 16 years doing that role, uh, made a lot of money, had a lot of connections, made a lot of friends, blah, blah, blah. But I was bored and I wanted a new challenge. Enter the benefit doctor. The benefit doctor is growing right now to become a different type of benefits agency where we work with entrepreneurs and so anywhere from a solopreneur with one person to, mm-hmm. to larger, much, much larger. You know, we, we really do well in the 100 plus space of employees, but wow. we help them put together some really unique benefit packages that most traditional brokers or most traditional agencies in the marketplace just either won't do or don't serve. Uh, and we've got a pretty unique way of doing it and we're having a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's, that's amazing, Zach. And you're cutting through the competition and actually adding so many benefits that you literally named it the benefit doctor, right? Mm-hmm. So the name literally, says it all. Right? Curing the pain of employee benefits right there, baby. <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's amazing, Zach. We really enjoyed this. So let's get to the next question, brother. Like you had a freak, like traveling countries, having fun with families, you know, being beardy on calls, even on the sales calls and client calls, which is freaking amazing. So we'd love to know more about like, how do you manage your productivity with all of your clients, day-to-day tasks, so many tools and everything. So how do you actually manage your productivity? Do you use any tools? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, man, that, that in and of itself, that's a giant question because that question will morph and change and grow as you morph and change and grow. So 16 years ago, it was, it was me. It was a one man show. It was me figuring it out. It was, uh, Golly, back then we didn't have iPhones or Androids or anything yet. So it was a paper calendar and a pen and and figuring it out, right? 16 years later, or, or golly, just in the insurance business alone, 16 years later, you know, we have a lot of tech and automation. Uh, I've got full-time staff that helps operate a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff. I know mm-hmm. we use ClickUp. Uh, I'm not uber, uber familiar with it, so don't ask me any real questions because my staff is the one that – put that in place and uses it and project manages stuff. And basically I'm in a place today where they just tell me what I have to do when they need it from me by, and then I get it done. So um, I love somebody else tracking all the minutia, but, but before I had the resources to be able to hire those people and manage the projects that way, it was me figuring it out. All in, right? That's, All that's in. amazing. Zach. Yeah. Like I love the way you are actually delegating yourself and you're being on the business and, having the real flourish in life. And you're in that stage where you're just having fun and making sure that your business is doing well, looking at the numbers. That's, that's amazing, Zach. So let's get to the next question. I know you're a travel freak, but I would love to know if you have any daily routine for your day to day business. You know, it's so funny. When I saw your questionnaire come across and I saw that question on there, I almost bowed my head in, in both shame and excitement. So oh I'm going to have to give you kind of two different answers prior to going on the road full time in the RV. Um, I would have given you one answer because I was in a very systematic routine where I did the same thing basically five to six days a week. Um, and I thought we would carry that routine into the RV. I don't know why, but it hasn't happened. Um, I have gained 20 pounds on the road. Uh, I don't have the same, disciplined focus on the road. It's probably because I have four and a half year old twins that are always within 20 feet of me (laughs) (laughs) and just managing it on the road. Hasn't been as easy as I thought it would be, but um, like we're, we're at uh, we're taking a a short two week break from the RV travel. We're back in our sticks and bricks home. We got a beautiful home out here in Tucson, Arizona, 
And uh, even though we've only been here three days, three days in a row, I'm back to my typical morning routine. I get up around six o'clock in the morning, six to six fifteen in the morning. Typically, the first thing I'm doing is getting ready, drinking a big. I have a thirty ounce water bottle, uh, and I drink three mm-hmm. of these a day, so I'll down thirty ounces of water. Then I head to the gym. I work out for about an hour in a group fitness class. I tend to find that I personally do really well with group type fitness right. where there's a bunch of other people to compete against and sweat with and moan and groan and cry about how bad it hurts. <laughs> and then, uh, after about an hour of that, come back to the house, I drink a cup of coffee. Well, I drink another deal of water. Then I drink my coffee. I read something in the mornings. I'll read a devotional or a piece of a uh, business article or something that interests me and gets my brain moving a little bit. And then it's on with the day at that point. But I tend to find Man, that first hour, hour and a half of my morning, uh, I have missed that. I have missed that more than I can tell you being on the road. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting back into that routine when we're back home. Absolutely, Zach. Love it. And I'm, I'm definitely excited to see the kind of progress you're delivering right now. And definitely once you get to the actual place and you, once you start with your routine, you can kick out your productivity for sure. So let's get to this question, Zach. I know you're very early in your business. It's been 25, 26 years in the journey, which is crazy. Let's say if there is an opportunity to speak to 20 year olds, you, the end you, or someone who's just getting started, what will be your number one suggestion for them? Oh my gosh. If I could go back to 20 year old self. Um, man, I, I think the one thing I would love to go back and tell myself at 20 years old is when you don't be afraid to make change, Mm -hmm. even when everything is going right. And let me, let me kind of clarify that for you. Uh, I spent 16 years in that insurance business role, uh, made, you know, did really well. And that was the problem. After about six years of being in that role, I knew I was ready to start making a change, but I had too much self doubt. And it was going too right. I was making too much money to make a change. I felt like, why would I make a change when I'm making multiple six figures of income? This doesn't make any sense. And so I talked myself out of it for another five years. And then another 10 years went by. And now that I'm doing what I am, like the digital side of my business did not start until 2019. Like that Mm -hmm. piece of the business is... And then I don't know if you heard, but this thing called Corona hit in 2020 and shut the whole world down, right? Yeah. Like I've only got two years at best. I've got two years of digital experience under my belt. And if, if I could go back and tell my 20 year old self something, I wish that I had started something new because I tore my heart and, and everything in me told me go this direction. But the business was going too good for me to make a change. I wish I wish I'd have made that change a lot sooner. Yeah, absolutely, Zach. I think I think that sort of that sort of happens to a lot of entrepreneurs who are already kind of having opportunity where they're making well good money, where they're kind of managing themselves well. They don't take that you know kind of kind of they don't take that courage to leap up or try something new. They be in that comfortable situation. Hey, I'm already doing this. Why to try something new, right? But you did it finally, and we're glad that we are on this podcast today after you do it. That's amazing, brother. So let's get Thank to the you. next question, brother. So I know you have done so much stuff in business, helping multiple businesses and stuff like that. But let's hear, what are your last biggest achievements so far and any next bigger goals? Uh, that was that was the one question on there. I was like, I don't even have to think about that. My biggest achievements uh, by far, I have won all kinds of awards. I've been on national stages. I have been sent around the world by insurance companies and showered with money and gifts and trips. And I've got tons of Tiffany vase glass crap sitting over there on the award shelf and all of that stuff. Like it pales, it pales into comparison to my biggest achievement is being a great father to my twin four year old or four and a half year olds now. And a, and a, and a lover to my spouse. Like I love her forever and ever. Amen. And being a great husband and a great father means more to me being present. Um, taking this last year, well now a year and a half off, I guess I'm still active, but not, not to the same intensity that I typically would be. But, uh, 
taking this last year and a half to focus on them and travel and enjoying the fruits of our labor, by far my biggest achievement. And as far as bigger goals next, yeah, like we're about to be landing back in Tucson full time. Uh, we're going to be here in October 2021. The kids will start preschool at that point, and I'm going to have about six hours a day of unrelented focus to get back into the the really digging into making the benefit doctor blow up. Oh, wow. That's exciting, Jack. I'm really appreciating it. I'm really, really excited to see the progress. I know for a fact how big it's going to be once you see all in, right? Once you see it all in, it's going to Oh yeah, I'm gonna have a Jake or absolutely. That's amazing. But let's get to the next question, Zach. This this will be fun, by the way. So, what was the mistake mistake so far in terms of business, especially? Uh, biggest business mistake. Of, oh man. Well, you know what? Like an awful lot of entrepreneurs out there. Uh, man, I made a lot of mistakes when I was first getting started. I went through a bankruptcy. Um, I went through a divorce. You know, uh, tw- a long time ago, a couple. A, 15 years ago, I don't know what it's been, but long time ago, went through bankruptcy, went through a divorce, um, was down and out and depressed. And that is unlike me. I am not that kind of person. I'm typically very upbeat and outgoing and fun loving and carefree. And that was not my story just, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made was letting my pride stand in my way of asking and seeking the help that I needed to get both personally and professionally. Uh, I think a lot of us that have that entrepreneur characteristic, we tend to believe that we are the only ones dealing with this. We're the only ones that are, are succeeding or failing or, or we're the only ones facing this problem or this challenge or, and it doesn't really matter what it is. Like for some reason we as entrepreneurs think that we're the only ones that have that issue. <laughs> and that, that's, that's not only so incredibly wrong and naive, it's dangerous because it doesn't allow us to open up and have that freedom of reaching out and, and, and seeking counsel, seeking input, seeking guidance from others truly that have already been on that journey and already battled those demons and already faced those battles and letting them speak into you, speak into your situation, speak into your business. Sometimes my biggest mistake by far is I wished I had learned that lesson a lot sooner too. It would have saved me an awful lot of heartache. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's quite common for a lot of entrepreneurs that once they see some sort of success, they be like, oh, I know everything. I don't need anyone's help. And they get into that mindset of, I can figure it out no matter what without anyone's help, right? But ask, yeah. that's how that's how you grow up. That's how you get it, right? So people need to be open, sharing their experiences, their problems, their successes so that they can get better advice and avoid that pitfalls, which a lot of entrepreneurs can see once they see good success. Every time ones go up, you get down immediately because of the ego, which is rising along with the success, right? So you yeah, need to keep right. avoiding that. Absolutely, Zach. Love it. Thank you so much for that answer. Let's go to the next question, brother. So your main inspiration for your success as well as any key people involved in your journey? I think today the inspiration for success is the is the team members that I get to work with and serve. Um, I, 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 get my, I get my kicks. I get my emotional high. I get my uh, energy from watching the people that I work with and that are on my teams and that, that I get to mentor and serve, watching them grow and expand and have much more su- success, much faster than, than a lot of people do. And that, man, that by far, uh, I get lit up every single time that happens. And as far as key people involved, I'd have to go back to the biggest person by far is my wife. She's my biggest cheerleader. We also met uh, this, this month is our nine year, no, hold on, eight year wedding anniversary, nine years of meeting each other. Um, and we met each other in this industry, like in the insurance industry. Um, my whole life has changed because of what I learned to do and how I learned to help people. Absolutely, Zach. Really love it. And, and that's a great feeling, by the way, when you see your team grow, that really fires up you to create a bigger impact and have a bigger team. And that, like looking at that stuff, like getting stuff done to your team and they are growing with you along the side when you're growing, that's a really great feeling to have. We appreciate that, brother. So, Zach, like, 
a such a cool person <laughs> traveling around with a long beard and taking 18 months of vacation <laughs> while you're running a multi eight trigger business which is freaking amazing so where can our audience find you mentoring brother uh well if they want to learn more about me or what we do they can simply uh, i mean a quick google search will probably pull me right up um i have done things so wrong in the in the digital world i still don't even have an authority page or any of that stuff set up but uh, they can simply look me up on either LinkedIn, uh, Z-A-K. I'm pretty easy to find. There's not a lot of Z-A-K Harlows out there. So Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever. Look me up. Shoot me a message. I'd love to say hi. <laughs> Absolutely, Zach. So just make sure to check out Zach Harlow's LinkedIn page. I'll be actually dropping down the podcast description in case if you want to become a sales ninja or need some help with sales ninja on this screen today. So make sure to contact him and you will have good times. So that's amazing, Zach. Appreciate it. Any last word before we conclude the entire podcast session for today? Yeah, man, I, I would just, first of all, thank you. Thank you to uh, for you and for your audience and for those that took the time to listen for the last 30 whatever minutes we've been hanging out. I truly hope this has provided some value and a little bit of insight. My, my final word would be, be true to you. Like don't, don't get so caught up in sales tactics and body language and um, persuasion techniques. And I know there's so much of that stuff being taught right now. And, and truly, like, here's the best thing that has served me and made me lots and lots of money over the years. And that is this, the faster you can treat your clients and serve your clients the exact way you like to be treated. I guess it goes back to the biblical golden rule, man, like treat others the same way you want to be treated. Uh, if you don't like, if you don't like receiving 15 or 16 or 20 or 25 emails within a 10 day span from a marketer then don't be the marketer that sends 25 emails because that's what your coach told you to do, right? Like, just think through it. How do I like to be treated? How do I like to be respected? How do I like to, how do I like it when somebody like Nikhil like pours value into me and makes me feel special? How can I make other people feel special and valued? And if you, if you center your sales process around that, there's a pretty good chance you're going to outpace and out earn um, all the tactics in the world. Yeah, absolutely, Zach. That was the right way to actually cut through the competition and make your own way, which is freaking amazing. And Zach, first of all, thank you so much for being you on this podcast, a completely raw you. No persuasion, no tactics, like unless other people. This is so amazing, Zach. Really love it. And the perspective you have when it comes to the sales and you know serving clients, it's just amazing uncomparable to anyone else in the industry which is freaking amazing i hope you enjoyed the time today guys who actually listen to this podcast today make sure to re-listen it take notes in case if you need any help with the sales ninja make sure to contact zach harlow on linkedin probably that's the easiest way it is in the description by the way so hope you enjoyed the podcast session today this is me the nikil sai and zach harlow signing off for today peace guys bye, -bye peace out, guys